Sankalp and today I have a very interesting uh, topic and conversation that we're going to have on impact investing and investing for impact and I have two people who are um, seemingly seem to be in very very different theses and philosophies of investing but it will be interesting to see your perspective. I have uh, Mr. Rajan Anandan, MD Sequoia India and Serge and Vineet Rai, founder and chairman Avishkar Group. Just to give a certain context, Sequoia Capital India is a venture capital firm based in India and Southeast Asia that actively participates with founders from a wide range of companies across categories. In, and some of these companies includes the likes of Baiju's, Gojek, Oyo Room, Stokopedia, True Caller, Zomato, and I think the list can go on and on. Uh, in partnering with Sequoia, startups uh, benefit from over 50 years of tribal knowledge and lessons from working with companies like Airbnb, Alibaba, Apple, Dropbox, Google, LinkedIn, and Stripe. And the list again goes on. So thank you so much for joining us, Rajan, and welcome. Um, Avishkar Capital, on the other hand, seeks to create impact unicorns, enterprises which will bring, which will better the lives of over a billion people along with providing commercial returns to combine profit with purpose. Quite interestingly, some of their portfolio companies have gone to become industry leaders and are listed with IPOs or have gotten acquired by global corporations. These include the likes of Arohan, Agrostar, Ergos, I, I, I Farms, and the list just goes on again. So clearly I have two investing approaches and investing firms. And we're trying to find a common ground here, interestingly, with some enterprises that attract both types and kinds of in investors, given the power of technology and powering solutions. In today's world, where investment is becoming equally dynamic, Rajan and Vineet will talk about how varied perspectives can enable entrepreneurs across spectrums in accessing capital and creating impact at scale. So. Thank you so much, Rajan, and thank you so much, Vineet, for joining. And I'll begin a question with both of you before I start going. For the both of you, what do you look for in companies? You know, what do you look for companies that you back? What are your measures for success? And maybe you can start with Vineet. I think uh, being one of the hosts, let, 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 let's have Rajan go first. Absolutely. Go for it, Rajan. Or Rajan, what do you look Thanks. for? Yeah, first of all, uh, thank you uh, to Vineet uh, and your team for uh, inviting me. And uh, Sindhu, uh, thanks for moderating this session. So look, I, I think, uh, for, firstly, as Sequoia Capital, you know, we invest in technology and technology-enabled companies. So we're very focused on uh, sort of tech and tech-enabled uh, companies. Now, uh, as all of us know, every business is a software business now. So some aspect of software. So that, you know, increases the scope of the kinds of things that we can do. Um, uh, but, but there are many, many sectors we don't invest in, right? So I think that's important to know. Now, in terms of what we look for, um, I, I would say, look, what we look for varies by stage. As Sequoia uh, Capital, um, you know, uh, in India, as well as in you know, the US and other countries where we invest, uh, we are idea through IPO investors, right? So we can invest, um, you know, two to three crores uh, in, in, let's say, an engineer or two engineers who are leaving uh, a company uh, to start up a company and we can invest uh, $2 million. Uh, we can invest, you know, 10 or $20 million all the way through, uh, you know, we can invest several hundreds of millions of dollars in a, in a growth stage company. So we, we do invest idea through IPO and what we look for um, uh, does vary, uh, you know, by stage, right? So uh, for instance, uh, you know, at the seed stage, uh, we launched about two and a half years ago a program called Surge, uh, which is uh, really for seed stage companies in India and Southeast Asia. Uh, and these tend to be very, very early stage companies, right? About a third of the companies we invest in are pre-launch, so they don't even have a product. Uh, the others have launched and they have a little bit of traction. So at that stage, uh, you know, the most important uh, factor for us is uh, the founding team, mm. right? The caliber of the founding team is there strong founder market fit. Do we believe these founders are resilient? They're going to go at it for 10, 20 years to build a company. Do they have truly unique insights about the problem that they're trying to solve? And, and then, you know, especially if it's, uh, you know, we do have single founders at search, but usually, you know, we have two, you know, there's usually two and in some cases, three 
uh, co-founders, uh, you know, between them, do they have the requisite set of skills, right? So, so we love backing in the tech space, uh, a product manager and an engineer combination, right? Because they can very quickly build, iterate and so on and so forth. Uh, so the team is sort of the single most important thing at seed stage. But even at seed stage, we also look at the market, right? To say, uh, is the market uh, large enough uh, uh, so that if they're successful, if this company is successful, uh, they will end up building a very large company, right? So, 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 so the way we look at it is uh, we want to partner with founders who, number one, want to build very, very large companies. Uh, um, uh, but, but secondly, the markets have to lend themselves to uh, building very large companies. So, right, that's at the seed stage. Uh, at Series A, let's say we are investing six or seven or $10 million. Uh, then we are looking for those two things. Obviously, we still continue to, at every stage, look, we're looking at the caliber of the uh, uh, of the founding team. But, you know, obviously, when you get to growth stages, it's not just the founder, right? It's, it's really a management team. Um, but at Series A, we're also looking for uh, ideally product market fit, but, but if not, at least early signs of product market fit. Uh, and by Series B, you're looking for scalable uh, sort of grow-to-market engines, right? The company needs to kind of scale very, very rapidly. So do they have that scalable uh, product market engine? And then finally, look when you look at growth investments, uh, the unit economics have to work. The PNL has to kind of be coming in shape, uh, and, and so on. So, so it's it's not a simple answer, uh, Sindhu. But uh, you know what we look for varies across uh, across uh, depending on the stage that we are investing in. So you would say the measures of success also would vary accordingly, then according to yeah, your absolutely. Story. And in fact, uh, you know, we we wrapped up our fifth cohort of surge uh, mm -hmm. yesterday, and uh, we were telling our you know I was running our final session. And I said, you know, a lot of Series A founders, for instance, uh, uh, you know, don't realize that Series B investors look for different things, right? So, so if they don't understand that, you know, like for instance, you know, by Series B, you have to have very, very strong product market fit, right? Series A, you might be able to still raise your round with early signs of PMF, but by Series B, uh, you know, you need to have product market fit. Your growth engines need to be firing, right? Because, uh, you know, you've got to be on sort of an explosive growth curve to be able to raise a Series B. Um, so absolutely. So, you know, investors look for different things at different different stages. But the one probably common, especially in, in the way we invest as Sequoia, uh, is, is founders, 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 right, at every stage, because we don't do very okay. late stages. We do some of that, but not that much, right? So we would invest in Series B, uh, Series C. So growth investing for us is usually Series B, C. We'll do some pre-IPO type investing, but very rarely. Right, right. Uh, you know, it has actually has been an interesting year for Sequoia, but more on that uh, later. Uh, Vineet, what, are, what do you look for in companies when you back them and what are your measures of success? Is it similar? Is it different? How does that work for, uh, you know, a fund like Avishkar? Listen, I think the uh, most important thing is uh, whether you are actually doing an Avishkar or a Sequoia or anywhere. Most of the things are the same, actually. Uh, so you heard from Rajan, I can actually repeat myself, but I'll try not to repeat myself. But actually, uh, Avishkar does uh, pre-revenue, uh, Series A, Series B. Uh, mm -hmm. we have, I think we have rarely done a Series C, but largely pre-revenue to Series A, Series B. We have been doing more of A and B lately. Uh, but if you look at our track record, we are used to do... Uh, and there again, as Rajan said, there are three questions we ask. And I think that the sequence of questions is slightly different, but similar questions. The only, I think Rajan, probably when you look at a company and you're looking at the great founders, you are very clear that there has to be in technology space, uh, which would be your screen. Effectively, the product company has to be in technology. For Avishkar, the screen is, so for example, whatever I'm looking at has to, so the first question is, how do you make impact? Right. So our screen is, uh, like in Sequoia's case, might be technology. In our case, it's impact. And what we are looking for is an articulation of impact because if it is a pre-revenue company, then everything is in future. Uh, and so what you are trying to see is, okay, so how do you deliver impact? And are you delivering impact by solving a very large problem? So in a very different way, uh, Rajan was saying, is this a very large market? We are right. looking at a large problem. And the large problem essentially means a large market in that sense. So nomenclature is slightly different, but hinting towards the same thing. First, are you impact? Then are you solving the problem by which you're delivering impact? Is it a very large problem? And then you move on to the third part of the question, which is, uh, do the entrepreneurs genuinely believe that they can solve this problem? And if this is actually a combination of one, two, or three, 
do they have the lasting uh, whether because as rajan was saying you take 10 15 years uh, in our case the challenge is slightly more tougher uh, the ecosystem is slightly more broken and there the challenge the, the requirement to the resilience required is much higher and, and so ultimately i genuinely believe that all companies make impact in right. our for example uh, the kind of companies that you mentioned that sequoia has done they all make significant impact uh, but when avishkar makes goes in it is actually going in with a very clear idea of building an impactful company right uh, and other investors are actually also building companies which are delivering significant returns uh, and significant impact we are also looking at impact and significant returns so just the priority is a little here there having said that we also genuinely believe that technology is probably the leveler uh, specifically it becomes more and more important when you are dealing with the companies for example agriculture where again rajan has significant investments and we also have significant we have been doing it for a very long period of time technology brings in a completely new and an angle to bring about change and therefore i think the common theme that we have seen evolve in avishkar as well over a period of time is technology is right at the center of the transformation that the world is seeing partly because of the transparency it creates and some of the problems that seem to be completely unsolvable become solvable the moment you bring in the capability of technology now so i think that's probably a common theme that is emerging Uh, yeah. yeah. You know, uh, Rajun, back to you with the current uh, situation we've all been facing for the past one and a half, two years now, two years now, and uh, you know, there is a strong focus in sustainability and you know, environmental impl- implication. Do you think it's, you know, investors in general should consider socio-economic implications when it comes to evaluating businesses? And do you see? Do you think investors see it as a barrier in making the right choices for economic value creation? Do you think that social, economic, environmental implications have been uh, ignored while looking at evaluating businesses, or is there going to be a growing focus? How do you see that changing now with the current scenario? I think. Look, at the end of the day, uh, um, you know, big companies get built uh, by addressing very large scale problems, right? And and um you know in some cases you're focusing on uh consumer focused problems in other focus cases you're focusing on uh you know problems that are faced by businesses i mean you could also be focusing on businesses that uh companies that either address consumers or businesses but also actually impact the impact the climate uh, i i think with india i mean specifically since we are in india we'll speak about india is look what's happening in india is very very interesting right we now have 600 million uh indians on the internet uh, that number will get to a billion uh, by 2025 right so we'll you know for 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 five years from now we're going to have a billion connected indians with probably north of 900 million daily active users each of them spending 5 6 hours on the internet so almost all of india is going to be connected right and when you have that level of connectivity uh you're able to deliver tech enabled uh solutions to pretty much almost every indian right not every indian because we'll have 1.4 billion by then but uh, uh you know outside of you know very small children and 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 very senior citizens you'll be able to uh deliver right and and what we are seeing actually we started seeing this from a couple of years ago uh mm-hmm. is now you know indian tech startups are are really focusing on uh what are what we would call sort of india's core sectors right that go and and also going well beyond call it the first 200 million indians right so as as we need to now pick up maybe a couple of examples um uh for instance you know if you take agriculture right so sequoia we made our very first investment in ag uh, ag tech so we will only invest in you know agricultural startups that also have some tech component to it yeah. um in a company called bjack it was in our uh, second quarter of surge that was about 2 years ago uh but now you know actually we, uh, uh, you know i think we made our seventh or eighth investment now it's not announced yet but if you look at like let's take just one of the many companies we invested in uh, and obviously these numbers are very small compared to what avishka would have invested in ag uh, like in our, in our current cohort of surge which is our fifth cohort we have a company called absolute right and absolute is a company that's based in kurgaon what they do is they use precision farming technologies to actually improve uh, yields in the fruits and vegetables value chain by up to 30% 
right? So imagine, you, you know, if you can actually improve farmer yields by 30%. And what, you know, and by the way, they did four or five years of research uh, on this precision farming tech technology. And what they do is they give the tech to, to farmers. They don't charge the farmers for, uh, for, for the tech, but their business model is sort of a market linkage based business model. That's so what that means is they, they buy the fruits and vegetables from farmers and then they basically sell it. And increasingly they're, they're basically building an export oriented uh, business model because the global fruits and vegetables uh, exports in the, around the world is $180 billion and India has 1% market share. The reason India has 1% market share is because our quality is poor and our consistency is non-existent. So with this sort of approach, if you can create very high quality, highly consistent produce uh, on fruits and vegetables products, right? You can pretty much become globally competitive overnight. So, so, so this is just one example of, of, of a company uh, that, you know, and by the way, Agam and Pratik were the co-founders of, of Absolute. Uh, their mission is to impact not just a billion Indians, right? They, they believe they can impact 3 billion people over the next two decades, right? And that's the kind of ambition uh, that they have. So, so, so whether it's agriculture, whether it's healthcare, I mean, if you take education, for instance, right? Like Baiju's, uh, Baiju's, Unacademy, et cetera. I mean, in many ways, they're still going after the college you know, the first 100 million Indians, right? But then you have companies like Doubtnut with a very, very different approach that are going to try to get to that 200, you know, India has 300 million students. Can you really get beyond the, uh, you know, first 100 million students? And the reality is, you know, Baiju's has now 10,000 crores of revenue, but they actually don't have, they have several million uh, paying students, uh, but they don't have tens of millions yet. So, so actually to get to 100 million students and really impact 100 million students, you need price points that are very, very different. You need delivery yeah. models that are very, very different. And so what you're seeing now with EdTech 2.0 and EdTech 3.0 is companies that are really innovating to try to get beyond the first 10 or 20 million paying students, right? Similarly in healthcare with digital health now, right? I mean, we have a company in our current cohort called, uh, called Vera Health, right? There are 100 million women uh, who have, who suffer from PCOS, uh, right? right? But the interesting thing about PCOS is actually you can manage it, you can control it. And over time you can't, you can't cure PCOS, but you can get it under control so that women can live a very normal life. So these two incredible co-founders are, are building this company uh, with digital therapeutics, right? Where you can kind of, and you know, and if it works, not just them, but other companies like them, you know, you could imagine making the lives of hundred million women fundamentally better, right? So, so, so whether it's ag, whether it's, uh, whether it's, whether it's education, whether it's healthcare, uh, SME digitization, right? I mean, SMEs were, you know, India has 75 million uh, small and medium businesses. Um, none of them were digitized really three, four years ago, right? They didn't use any software. Geo happened, then a bunch of things, other happened, they started using WhatsApp and YouTube and Google search and so on. Uh, and then companies like Kata Book came up and, and built very, very simple software products that can be used by very small businesses. And boom, they're the fastest zero to 10 million uh, business adoption of software company in the history of the world, right? And now they're actually using that install base to start providing more and more uh, services, including over time financial services uh, to, those, to those businesses, right? So, so, so SMEs, right? I mean, you know, a massive number, right? I mean, we've got 75 million small businesses. They employ over 400 million people in India. So you're looking at hundreds of millions of, so, so I guess what I'm saying is, um, you know, I think this question of, you know, if you had asked me maybe 2015, 2016, 2017, uh, Indian tech startups were still very much focused on the first 50 million Indians or the first 100 million Indians, right? That has now changed. And, and the single biggest enabler of that has been the fact that 600 million Indians are now uh, connected to the internet, right? And, 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 and that all of a sudden when you get connected now, you know, startups can build products and solutions that can reach uh, that can reach a large number of, uh, of, of users. So, um, yes. you know, are we still, you know, building for, one, you know, all of 1.3 billion? Not yet, but I think we're literally four or five years away, right? Because I have this strong thesis that, you know, once you get humans connected to the internet, all of a sudden you can start building superbly interesting products that meet, a, you know, that meet, their, uh, meet their core needs, right? The kind of innovation now we're seeing in scaling is extraordinary, right? I mean, yes. a company like Scalar Academy, right? I mean, Google has 100,000 engineers. Okay, that's it. Company is almost worth $2 trillion. At the core of Google is this Google quality engineers, right? Scaler's mission is very simple. Um, to create a million Google quality engineers in India over the next few years, right? Imagine if Scaler is successful, what could happen to India, 
right? You know, what, what, why Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley, because of talent, right? You know, India can have many cities, you know, at that scale. Uh, and today, by the way, I mean, if you're a startup, you can't hire engineers, right? In India, you just can't hire engineers because there just aren't enough of them uh, of, of, of quality. So it's a long answer to your question, Sindhu, but we are now, you know, I think Indian startups are having impact that is so far reaching. And these are just a few companies, right? I mean, I can spend all day talking about companies that are superbly interesting, that are doing things that, you know, even we could have not imagined two years ago in India. Right. You know, so from what I'm getting, both of you are angling towards the same thing. Technology and internet is a great leverer across sectors, whether it's agriculture, healthcare, and Vineet, you also gave a few examples. And I think the lines are blurring. Am I, am I right? Lines are more blurring now with and uh, that is primarily thanks to your internet to connectivity technology that has to, uh, enabled all of this kind of growth and impact that's being created, right? Isn't there, I yeah, think, I, you uh, know, it, it is blurring, uh, but maybe Vineet, you should. I think the difference is, look, so, you know, I think, uh, and Vineet should speak about how, how Avishka operates. Like, like the only difference is, look, we have to send to see a multi-billion dollar company. Okay, so right. India, yeah. India should have, I actually think India should have tens of thousands of ag tech startups because, you know, there's so much value to be added. There's so much impact you can have on farmers, right? But very few of them will become truly multi-billion dollar, right? Absolute, if it's successful, is a $50 billion company, 50 billion, right? So, I mean, that's like planetary scale impact, right? Because you impact 3 billion people around the world. You're going to build a gigantic company. Uh, now, of course, so, so, so I think from an, so, you, you know, if I was an impact investor, maybe I wouldn't focus, I would still want to see large impact, you know, on, on, on tens, if not hundreds of millions of people, but maybe I wouldn't focus as much on, and, and that's maybe what, you know, Vineet can speak a lot yeah. more about yeah. how Avishka it, looks at that lens. It, on, you know, how you've seen the space evolve in your time because you've been uh, investing from before the time word impact investing was even coined or became as uh, cool as it is today. So what's your approach and how does this so work? Sindhu, I think, uh, I think it's, a, it's a very simple uh, uh, question and a very simple answer. Uh, why is impact investing there? Uh, and impact investing is there not because uh, we have to prove ourselves that we are making impact. But impact investing is there because the world has actually a lot of money. Roughly $300 trillion, uh, maybe a little more actually now, $400 trillion, if I heard. So there's, this is a very large pool of capital. Now in 2018, uh, there's something called Sustainable Development Goals, where we actually talked about uh, by 2030, the world has should have nobody hungry, sleeping hungry, nobody who's poor, and nobody should be unequal. So it's an unimaginable goal. Humanity, since the time Homo sapiens started walking straight, has not seen a world like that. So this is the imagination of all the presidents and prime ministers of the world. They have all signed it under the UN ages. Now, this is a goal that exists. Uh, now, Impact investing, when it started, what was it saying? The total global donor capital is 300 billion. Mm. So one side, you have $300 trillion of real capital. And then you have all the philanthropic capital put together is 300 billion. Mm. And I'm on an annualized basis. So if you're going to spend and change the world, to reach where there's no poverty, no hunger, no inequity, you make a guess how much money do you need on an annual basis? You roughly need $3 trillion. $3 trillion. $3 so $3 trillion to be spent over 12 years. This study was done in 2018. So 12 years into three, $36 trillion, $40 trillion. With $400 trillion, you are just talking about people to spare 1% of the capital on solving world's problems. To have a world that we have never seen ever in our history. Now, how big is that goal? It's a very small goal, I'm just asking people to give away 1%. So what's the genesis and the reason for impact investing to exist? Impact investing has to exist to blur the boundaries between investing and making impact. And as you heard from Anand, what is happening is kind of innovations. Now, internet was not tried, was not created to actually blur the boundaries between impact and non-impact. It was created for some other reason. But there are incidental outcomes that are coming through, which are yeah. actually making it very valuable. So right. what impact investing role? Impact investing role is to actually create a bridge and attract investors like Sequoia to play the role into very disruptive areas where technology has played a role. For example, we have been investing in agriculture since 2007. Okay, we are in 2021. And in 2021, suddenly you see a fairly massive interest from mainstream investors. 
what does this transition mean? 14 years of investing and now suddenly in three years, but that inflection is very important. It is critical and important for people like Rajan mm. to check agriculture and for Rajan to say, listen guys, a $50 billion company can come out of India in the space of agriculture for all the reasons he has said, because this is what will make that 3 trillion or 3.5 trillion to mark, mark itself into the territory of delivering the returns that we see. Otherwise, we have no role. So our role is role of not, we are not the equation, we are the catalyst. Our job is to actually demonstrate and attract uh, the world's best talent, the world's significant capital to the areas that will bring about that transformation and change. And therefore, impact investing, in my, in my belief, role is to make the mainstream become impact investing. That means whatever job we are doing, if everybody does it, then we are irrelevant. And India is actually a great case. The fact that Rajan, Sequoia, and Avishkar are sitting on the same table talking about similar kind of companies will tell you that India probably is the only place in the world where the boundaries have blurred significantly. And yeah. therefore, is the right case for the world to emulate. Uh, and this is really the beauty of India. And that's the power of India, uh, that we are able to talk about companies that both Rajan and I are aspiring to fight to invest in. That really is the world-changing phenomena that we have managed to do. Yeah. And to yeah. me, that's really success. Yeah, true. That is that is actually very powerful as well as Rajan was saying, and even you were adding many impact is when you can marry the two together and bring out that significant uh, push. But uh, Rajan, my question to you, Serge, you said this is your fifth cohort and you have some really very interesting startups, you know, whether in uh, pure tech space or whether it comes across segments and across sectors. So I wanted to understand, you see, it's is it a phenomenon? You've been investing for a while now. So is it is it a phenomenon that you are seeing with more young founders today that are tackling global challenges through their work. Are they, is there a mindset shift of way, the way the youngsters and the younger founders look at these problems today? Yeah, I think, I think look, uh, uh, sort of, you know, 40% of our current surge cohorts, mm. uh, cohorts are 35 to 40% of the cohort over the last three co cohorts are basically startups that are building for the world from day zero. Uh, but Sindhu, they are uh, mostly SaaS companies and dev tools companies, right? So, uh, you know, Freshworks went public on NASDAQ two weeks ago. Uh, you know, we, you know we, we were a very, very significant investor in Freshworks, right? Um, uh, many other Indian SaaS companies will go pub. So, so today where, where you're seeing sort of, um, you know, global uh, startups from India aspiring to build for the world from day zero, uh, is really primarily in the area of software as a service and developer tools, right? So companies like Postman or Browser Stack or in our search portfolio, we have companies like Lambda Test. Uh, so we have a large number of companies uh, because, you know, in many ways, building for the world, you know, for a software products company is easier uh, because, you know, you target an ideal customer profile. A lot of them actually come from uh, SaaS companies. You know, you can build, uh, you, know, you know, you can have your product and engineering teams here because of digital distribution, you can acquire customers there. And now with, you know, post COVID, uh, there's no freedom on the street even sales, even in the US. So everything is done over Zoom and so on and so forth. So that is sort of where we are seeing, you know, uh, massive amounts of action. So if you ask me, I mean, this is not the topic of, of, of this discussion, right? What is the single most powerful theme uh, for Indian startups this decade? It's software as a service, right? Uh, you know, Freshworks is trading at over $10 billion. I mean, Freshworks is going to be a 50 and $100 billion company, right? I mean, yeah. there's just almost like you can you can bank that, right, at this at this point, because it's it's that kind of company with that much sort of headroom in the markets that they compete with that kind of management team, right? So, and there are going to be many, many more companies like, uh, like Freshworks. I think what you will see in terms of globalization in, let's say, a traditional sector, like Baiju's is a great example, right? Baiju's, I mean... Uh, you know, you you guys at your story have posted it many times. I mean, you talked about. I mean, he, he wants to build a global, uh, global, global franchise, right? A global brand. And in fact, when I was at Google for a long time, you know, I guess question every other day, which is, you know, where is the Google of India? I mean, I said, look, it's that's actually the wrong question to ask. The Google of India is Google, but the question to ask is, what's the Baiju's of the world? The Baiju's of the world is going to be Baiju's, right? So, um, uh, so, so I think uh, I think you will start seeing. I think on consumer, it's. It's not as prevalent, but I think increasingly you will see, uh, uh, you know, Indian companies like, like there's no reason why India, 
shouldn't be the education capital of the world, right? Uh, I mean, we there's no reason why India can't have 20, 30 million high quality teachers. I mean, today we have, I think, about 10 million teachers or something. Now, obviously, we can debate, yeah, you know, the quality of, of the teachers, but there's no reason why we can't, you know, because what we have, right, India's superpower is not our population. Our superpower is our talent, right? And 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 we've just got to be able to upskill and, and really educate the world, right? There's no reason why India can't be the uh, digital, I mean, the, the healthcare hub of the world, right? I mean, you look at how expensive healthcare has gotten yeah. in most developed markets. It's insane, right? Uh, you know, I mean, at some point, you know, it's going to be easier for you to take, uh, you know, Blue Horizon, you know, Jeff Bezos's, uh, you know, space shuttle, you know, take off, land in India and get your surgery done in India because it is getting so expensive, uh, getting so expensive uh, in the US, right? So, so I think you'll start seeing that. I mean, I, you know, we talked about this company, Absolute, right? Agam and Pratik are very clear. They're not building a company only for India. They're going to start in India, but they see, you know, 3 billion people they can impact in, uh, you know, most places around the world, right? So, 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 so I think you'll start seeing, seeing a lot of that. But look, what has changed with Indian entrepreneurs, especially sort of the uh, at, you know, whether they're very young or whether they're, uh, you know, in their 20s or 30s or 40s or even 50s is the ambition, mm. right? The ambition levels have changed, right? I mean, Indian entrepreneurs today do not want to build small companies. They want to build very, very, very large companies. You know, Nandan talks about population scale, right? Actually, now we are beyond population scale. Our, our founders now want to build planetary scale companies, right? <laughs> our plan. Uh, you know, and of course, then you have, you know, Bezos and, you know, they're, they're, they're interplanetary scale, right? We're not there yet, uh, you know, with Elon Musk and Bezos and others, but we are certainly at the planetary scale. Right, right. You know, it's interesting when you talk of scale in such vast and big words, you know, initially it was just global looking at it. Now you're saying planetary and soon, hopefully soon in India. I mean, we always leapfrog. So I'm guessing we'll say interplanetary scale soon and hopefully that happens soon. But, you know, I just want to take a step back, Vineet, and go to what you were mentioning of, you know, the, in India alone, the lines are blurring when it comes to investors working together of, you know, mainstream and impact investors working together. So from Avishka's point of view, what are the current sectors and themes that you see that mainstream investors can play an active role with? I think the themes are actually already fairly well laid out in India. You have to look at big sectors and look at where are the populations, uh, where, where is it that you can actually make a significant dent. So, I mean, you can start from uh, financial services. There is so much and more taking place there that, uh, uh, and I think India has done phenomenally well in creating what you, what, what I was actually talking about earlier is financial inclusion. Uh, mm -hmm you can actually create a very large company uh, without with 100 million people uh, or even let's say 10 million people or 20 million, 30 million people. But uh, if you can create a large company that impacts 500 million people, which is what we talk about as impact unicorn or a billion people, mm -hmm. then you've really created what we, what we aspire for, which is inclusion. How do you make the world slightly flatter? Uh, when there is an aspiration to go interplanetary and planetary, how does <laughs> actually bring it back to making people slightly less unequal. And that really is a challenge, uh, yeah. which we're aspiring for. Uh, it's a easier, in my view, it's a far lower end challenge than actually doing the interplanetary solution. Uh, but how do you convince uh, people to focus on this is actually a challenge, but it has been done in financial inclusion to a great extent in India. Yeah. Yeah. I think we are seeing the same thing happen on the agriculture side. I mean, the Prime Minister called for, can you double the farmer's income in five years' time? Probably would have been an impossible thought uh, had, if you take out the startup ecosystem. Because the startup ecosystem, because of various kind of innovations and ability to attract capital, a farmer will never be able to attract the kind of capital that, uh, let's say, an Agrostar or an Argos, some of our companies have been able to attract. One of the reasons they're able to attract is because they are creating a proposition that is appeals to investors, both impact and non-impact. And right. that to me is a beauty. So where can we go? I mean, if you look around, Prime Minister again talked about something called Swachh Bharat 2.0, right? What is 2.0? Uh, well, you have to convert the waste boundaries. I mean, just look outside, look at Bombay, look at Delhi. We have huge mounds of uh, landfills which are standing out like Mount Everest. They are no more <laughs> landfills. Now, why would you allow that to actually exist in a country where we actually have this quality of talent, this quality of capital? And... Mm -hmm. 
because it's not government's role. If you can actually bring in private sector, you can go create. So we have a company called Let's Recycle that is completely reshaping and changing the way waste is creating value. And this is not government paying for it. This company pays to the government to convert waste into wealth. And at the same time, converting thousands and thousands of people into highly skilled jobs who are basically rack pickers. Now, that's really the change that we are trying to aspire for. And that change is possible if we can bring everybody together. So for me, the transition is taking place in almost every uh, space. Uh, it is taking place in waste, water. Water is a huge issue. I mean, water is going to be the issue that would probably lead to the fourth world war. Uh, and how do you deal with that? Because without water, how do you survive? Now, making available water. So India has a lot of bottled water companies. But is water a right? Would you actually not give people water if they don't have money? That's really the kind of question. So how do you actually get business and money to work for creating water in such a manner that water is not priced? How do you make money? Now, that's where the talent lies. That's why when I talk about money and talent, can money and talent come in such a manner that absolute availability of water is not an issue? Put in billions of dollars so that people do not need to deal with chloride, fluoride, and other challenges. Uh, but we have done so and has seen happen in carbon credits. Today, you actually can grow a tree and people are willing to give hundreds of millions of dollars. And Avishkar itself is contemplating launching one of the largest uh, uh, bio uh, carbon based carbon uh, bio biodiversity based carbon sequestration fund. We are looking to launch a fairly large $400 million fund uh, where you will give away money to let people grow trees, let communities actually have lots and lots of trees. And we will not ask them to return the money. We will try to actually use the carbon credits to trade in the future and create returns for ourselves. So I think the if we can attract the global talent to rethink, uh, they can and we can, because remember that uh, if you go to the European standard of mineral consumption, we will require two earths just to survive. If the whole yeah. European standards of mineral consumption, you require two earths, which yeah. unfortunately don't have two earths despite our minor forays outside the planet. And so we need to find innovative ways to actually bring down some of the consumption. And at the same time, at the same time, continue to grow, continue to scale. And I think that's where virtual world offers you this great idea. I mean, who could have actually imagined Freshworks actually getting listed uh, uh, in, in NASDAQ at $10 billion about 10 years back? It is possible uh, because there is a virtual world. And as Rajan mentioned, that virtual world allows you to do everything on Zoom. But how do you actually feed a hungry child in sub-Saharan Africa or in Jharkhand or Orissa or anywhere uh, virtually? That's really the challenge that we are trying to solve. And I'm actually saying it is possible. We just need to disconnect the wealth creation aspect to feeding the hungry child or connect the two without actually the hungry child paying for it uh, and not using philanthropy. No, that's interesting. That's a startup problem in itself. And I'm sure there will be some solutions if you it's are- It's a hundred trillion. It's a hundred trillion. Uh, if you are able to solve it, you will make hundreds of trillions of dollars. So. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that, that's that's massive. We have massive opportunities. That's I mean, there just seems to be no doubt about that. But Rajan, when we talk about inclusion, there is an important- segment that we end up missing. It is about diversity and diversity and one aspect of diversity is gender diversity. Now, when it comes to Sequoia for the past few years, you've been quite vocal and active about this segment. You also launched Spark recently, a fellowship program for women founders. It's an area that even impact investors are, uh, are looking and being focused on. So I want to understand Rajan from your perspective, why is it important? Why that focus? Why did you feel it is important to go out there and talk talk about it openly and loudly? I think it's a great question, Sindhu. I mean, this is a topic that we are very, very passionate about. Uh, look, if you look at the Indian, and by the way, it's not just the Indian, you can look at any other country's startup ecosystem um, when it comes to gender, right? But if you look at just India statistics, right? If you look at funded startups, uh, only 12% of India's funded startups, funded at any level, right? From seed through uh, growth. Uh, only 12% have at least one or more female founders. Um, but then if you look at the total funding, um, uh, we actually published this data, I think, in a blog uh, at, in, you know, at towards the end of 2020. Um, if you look at the total funding that goes into Indian startups, only 5% uh, 
uh, actually goes into uh, startups with at least one or more female founders, right? Uh, and then if you look at actually the third statistic, which is even more worrying is, if you look at the average funding round, right, in India, uh, across all rounds, right? So, so obviously, uh, you know, the big rounds tend to skew this, uh, is about $10 million. But then if you look at the average, the same exact way you calculate, um, the average funding round for a startup that actually has a, uh, as, has a female founder, uh, it's only four million. So, so I mean, regardless of how you cut this data, uh, we are absolutely in a, uh, you know, no, you know not, not nowhere close to where we should be, right? And why is it important? Look, it's very important because you know half the world's, uh, half the half of our planet is actually, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> women, uh, and and we know how extraordinary women are, right? Whether it comes to business, entrepreneurship, governance, politics, I mean, you name it, um, uh, and 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 it's super super important that that we have. Uh, many, many more female founders, right? Uh, starting up companies, building companies, scaling companies. And and uh, and so it's been a big focus for us. In fact, if you look at our current cohort of Surge uh, Sindhu, right? We have 23 companies. We have 10 female founders. It's the most diverse cohort uh, that we have. And and if you look at some of the most, like for instance, this uh, Vera Health, right? This company uh, that I talked about, um, Shobita and Shashwata are basically uh, their sisters. I mean, you look at the academic pedigree, it's astounding. <laughs> I mean, like, you know, like, like yeah. Shovita was number yeah. one in a McKinsey class. And my <laughs> diligence was very simple. I was a McKinsey partner in Chicago. I called the McKinsey partner who she worked with. She said, I was so sad she's leaving. And she, she picks up her bag's boobs, right? The sister, the PhD, you know, I like, worked at GlaxoSmith class. They come back to India to solve this problem because, you know, one of the sisters, uh, uh, you know, has this. So, 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 so it's very, very important. And, and I think what we, the reason we launched Spark uh, and though for those of you that don't know Spark, Spark is basically a, uh, a Spark has many things. So one one part of Spark is uh, we are going to pick fifteen uh, for, you know female founder led startups and and give them a hundred thousand uh, dollar grant. There's no equity; it's an equity free grant uh, because you know we'll better just help them you know as they raise their funding. We don't you know it's it's, it's something we wanted to do. But then the, the really important part of it is we are going to mentor each of these companies for twelve months very intensively. So a Sequoia partner will sign up. Um, you know, and, and work with work with a company over a period of a year just to make sure that they get the kind of mentoring, the access to all of Sequoia, the networks that we have as a firm and so on and so forth. So that's one part of this. The other part of it is a much more, uh, you know, of a scale out program, right? We're doing uh, we're doing basically a lot of programming. Uh, uh, so for female founders who might be on the call, uh, you know, you should be able to sign up and, 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 you know, on all the different aspects, right? On product, on engineering, on building teams. Uh, I'm running a session on, on fundraising. Uh, I think in a week or two. So, so those are open to any female founder, uh, actually anywhere in the world. But you know, we're primarily targeting India and uh, India and Southeast Asia. So, 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 so you know, we're doing a whole bunch of things. Look, at the end of the day, uh, you know, I think as investors, uh, all of us, right, whether you're uh, early stage, late stage, um, you know, investors, I think all of us need to do a lot more to make sure that we can just have many more female uh, female founders starting up and and building companies. Yeah. And uh, I hope more such come up, more programs come up that is starting, but there is a long way to go, like you said. Now, Vineet, when you look at the Avishkar group, you recently launched an impact report that had shared the group's journey through the lives of 12 women. Now, going forward, are there any specific goals you've outlined, both from a group as well as a fund perspective? Yeah, so I think uh, uh, just to let you know, there is something called a 2x challenge that is going on. And a 2x challenge is essentially about some of the largest LPs, uh, limited partners, which are basically investors in funds, coming together to ask the fund managers if they are willing to take voluntarily uh, a higher, higher purpose uh, responsibility uh, to female founders to, uh, to, and investing in them. Uh, not only creating, so you have to first qualify based on certain criteria they have in terms of the kind of people you have and uh, whether women are actually in decision-making positions within the group. So Avishkar group qualifies, Avishkar Capital also qualifies. Uh, and uh, what we have done, and I think I'm actually quite, quite happy to announce that, that our latest fund is going to be a 2X flagship. And when I say 2X flagship, the responsibility here is not just about what Avishkar does or what Avishkar Investing Company does, but what kind of gender diversity exists in the Avishkar Investing Company also is an accountability that we are taking to actually be evaluated by external partners. Now that's a very high level of accountability that we are seeking. 
partly because we believe, and Avishkar actually by naturally has had a fairly high, uh, and the whole group has a very high percentage of women employees, except one part of our business, Arohan, which is a microfinance institution, 99.9% .9 of our borrowers are women, but we had only 1% women employees. So 99% male employees serving 99.9% .9 female borrowers. That we found extremely absurd. And uh, in one year, we have gone from 1% to 10%. And yeah. remember, we operate in Northeast, Assam, Bihar, Bengal, Jharkhand, Orissa, and we are operating in the remotest part of it to actually bring 10%. And we have 6,000 employees to so go from 6, 600, so from 60 to 600 in one year. And then our plan is to become 25 and 50% by 2025. We are actually holding ourselves accountable and our managing director's number one KPI is gender diversity. So that's one part of it. Now we are doing it not because we are obligated to do it. There is nobody asking it. It is actually we are doing it for same reason that Rajan mentioned. High talent and uh, real diversification allows you to have access to a talent that thinks differently. Yeah. And quickly touch upon microfinance. What has microfinance taught us? Today, men do not get a loan, but women get a loan. Why do women get a loan? Are they better entrepreneurs? The answer is there is no evidence that proves that they are better entrepreneurs. But what are they? They have a higher purpose. They return the money. Returning their money is not necessarily linked with them being better entrepreneurs. So what we can tell you today is there is real evidence in microfinance that women are better borrowers than men. There is real. We have to, we don't know, neither nor Rajan, nor I, or nor anybody in the world knows, are women better entrepreneurs. But if they are better borrowers and last 40 years track record suggests they are, then who knows if we are able to create large number of women entrepreneurs, we may figure out they are better entrepreneurs as well. And so that's, and I think the reason of them being better borrowers is because they are looking at borrowing as a higher purpose activity than just a transactional activity. And to me, that probably is the learning that we have got. And we are trying to assimilate that learning to become a better organization and hopefully, therefore, achieve a better and more homogeneous and more equal world. It's just really wonderful to hear both of you speak about uh, gender and diversity. So, uh, so in, in such a different light and in such a forward thinking way, like you've tied microfinance and Rajan, you're looking at it more from, you know, entrepreneurs and companies and backgrounds. And I've uh, covered Vira Health, so I do know what you're talking about when it comes to the founding team. So it is interesting. And thank you as a part of the other gender. Thanks a lot. And, uh, you know, but I want to get to the pandemic. We've all been talking about so much about the pandemic and, you know, its impact and how it's been unprecedented. I think the word has been overused and abused, but it has been unprecedented. It has also increased a collective awareness and understanding of the world we're living in you know, the impact we've had over the climate. I mean, it's not like climate change was not being spoken about earlier, but the pandemic has made it more evident, the crisis more evident. And we all know now that it will require heavy private investment and capital to be funded in the segment. So what is your view, Rajan, on, uh, you know, climate focused startups? What are, are you, is Sequoia looking at them? Is Surge looking at them? How do you view it? I mean, look, uh, it's, uh, uh, it, it's a supremely important topic, uh, right? <laughs> Let's just hope that we're able to contain uh, global warming to 1.5 degrees by 2050. But I don't know how many, I mean, I assume Beneath and his team obviously all over this. But otherwise, by the way, 70% of India's land becomes unlivable, okay? That's 30 years from now. So <laughs> this is like huge, 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 uh, huge, huge crisis, right? And, and obviously... Um, you know, getting control of it is, is a combination of public policy, public awareness, uh, innovation, uh, which requires obviously entrepreneurship, capital, etc. Um, you know, as Sequoia, look, uh, you, you know, if you look at, uh, uh, you, you know, the bigger sources of pollution, right, and then you think about where can, uh, where can, where can innovation play a role? The first answer is innovation can play a role in every part of, uh, every part of this, right? Uh, but then, you know, for a firm like us, also, we have to uh, look at and say, like, wh wh what parts of this sort of types of innovation can, you know, play naturally to what we understand and what we know, right? Um, so, so, so we think one area is clearly uh, electric vehicles. Uh, mm -hmm. So we have actually one of our most interesting companies, you may have heard of it, uh, Sindhu and Vineet is a company called Log9, they're Bangalore-based mm -hmm. startup. Uh, you know, they're, they're when we, you know, when we invested in them about two years ago, uh, these are like, again, right, missionary founders. 
um, you know, what they want to do is make fuel cells using aluminum, right? So uh, if, if, if we don't have an innovation like this and other innovations like this, the whole world is going to basically depend on China uh, for fuel cells, right? So we, we go from depending on one part of the world for, for, for oil, uh, which is highly pollutive, to another part of the world uh, for, for basically uh, all the, all, all, you know, what we need to actually build fuel cells. So that's not good. Now, now the good thing about India is we have, you know, plethora of aluminum, right? And, and, and these guys are working on basically uh, developing fuel cells with aluminum. Now, that's sort of the midterm plan. In the near term, uh, they built, uh, they built you know, basically uh, fast charging batteries uh, called InstaCharge, right? Basically 15 minute recharge, 70 kilometer range. And they currently have a few dozen uh, of these batteries on the roads uh, with some of the big uh, sort of, co and, and focus on commercial, right? So, so, so I think we think EV and we, we, you know, we're looking for, so that's a very, very core uh, EV investment that we have. I mean, again, if this works, by the way, it's, you know, it's global, right? Uh, it's yeah. global and it'll be massive, yeah. right? Now, you know, will they will they achieve their full potential? Time will tell, right? Uh, because lots of things have to uh, go well. Uh, we, we think there's a bunch of other sectors, like, for instance, we think uh, clean uh, food is interesting. We think regenerative agriculture. So, you know, we are investors in ag tech. Uh, so we are looking for regenerative sort of agriculture. You know, it's super interesting, not in India, but we talked to this company in Singapore that's basically looking at, uh, you know, bio sort of driven feeds uh, for fish. All right. So, 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 you know, across the board, and then you obviously have sort of the more breakthrough uh, things, right? Like uh, carbon sequestration and, you know, can you actually come up with new technologies that will pull carbon out of there and so on and so forth. So, so, so I would say, look, we are, uh, we, we certainly an, an area we've started thinking about, uh, but we won't be able to, I mean, I'm thrilled to hear that Vineet and team are going to raise a large fund. Uh, in fact, you know, I keep telling my team, right, if, 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 if I had $100 billion, I would take $10 billion of it. And I would put it into climate because the reason the reason Sindhu is because a lot of the major breakthrough innovations are actually have to be very long term, right? They're beyond sort of our uh, kind yeah. of investing, and and they have to really take a lot more risk than we would, right? Because you have to take technology risk, uh, you have to take regulatory risk, you have to take market adoption risk, and you have to take execution risk. I mean, that is a lot more risk than we want to take, right? I mean, we are okay to take technology risk. But technology risk, regulatory risk, market adoption risk, and execution risk, right? That doesn't sound like a classic, uh, classic venture capital yeah. uh, sort of risk profile. So, so you really need, uh, and so that's why, you know, it's remarkable what Bill Gates is doing, right? I mean, I, I mean, he's just extraordinary, right? <laughs> I mean, like, uh, you know, from, from, from nuclear fusion all the way through clean cement to clean steel uh, to, to, to beyond meat, right? So, I mean, that's the sort of spectrum of, uh, investments that somebody like Bill Gates can make because, you know, he doesn't have LPs and, you know, he can focus on, you know, take a 50 year view on and invest in things. So it's a long answer to your question. So I would say absolutely, we completely understand how important it is. We think it's the single most important crisis the you know, we face as, 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 as a human race uh, over yeah. the next 50 years. But at the same time, we are also conscious that there are only sub segments of this uh, uh, you know, so, sort of type of innovation that we can address today, but that'll change over time, right? As as regulatory yeah. risk gets solved, uh, as yeah. technology risk gets solved, and so on and so forth. Right. You know, uh, Vineet, I want to ask this, and uh, Rajan brought out a very important point about you know how it's going to investors will need to take a long term view on it. It's not your uh, 10 year, seven year, seven to 10 year horizon. It's a much, much longer term view. So I just want to understand how should impact investors look at it and how should they focus of investments in this space? Because I think uh, it's happening within our generation and we're going to see the impact today, like right now. So how do you think impact investors as such should look at it? Sindhu, I think uh, <clears throat> I'm a forester. Okay, I I used to live in a forest before I actually came to the space. So the term both LP, GP, etc. were quite novel to me and so is money. I, I had never seen enough money. Uh, what I knew for a fact that uh, for a teak tree to mature, it takes 100 years. Okay, mm -hmm. for a salt, salt tree, Shoria Robusta to mature, it takes 80 years. So, and then we try to actually bring in eucalyptus, which matures in eight to 10 years. And therefore you try to shorten it. And the world then figured out that monoculture is not good. And so we try to reverse everything. And uh, I think uh, what we are trying to do at Avishkar is trying to challenge the whole paradigm of a 78 year investing cycle, uh, which actually uh, thrives when you have technology, virtuality, virality, all playing through. 
but how do you grow a tree in 6 years <laughs> no amount of technology because carbon uh, rajan talked about how do you take carbon out of the out of the air the best technology was designed by god in terms of a tree unfortunately it just takes a long time and that technology exists and works perfectly uh, the problem is that uh, that technology has not been allowed to flourish because we cut it the moment it is actually worthwhile we cut it log it and try to make boats or whatever out of it and so we went to the lps and said hey guys can you give us 20 year money uh, that we will distribute just give us money we will distribute to people to plant hundreds and thousands millions of not hundreds of millions hundreds hundreds and hundreds of millions of trees all over the world and then hopefully because there is a net zero because as uh, rajan has and you pointed out there won't be any of us living or surviving after 50 years if we are not able to control the temperature below 1.5 degree the, the moment if it doesn't if you are not able to control that we will not be really there so right. if that is going to happen all the all the large companies all the billion trillion dollar companies uh, have to change the way they operate uh, which means most of them have gone to the public and said we want to be net zero now what does that net zero mean and where will you how will you become net zero in a very defined time frame the only way to do is to know the technology that exists which is the tree right uh, and uh, i think elon musk actually did uh, on twitter say i will give 100 million to somebody who comes with the best uh, this thing and a guy actually put in a photograph of a tree and said where is my 100 million so i am actually just taking inspiration from that uh, twitter reaction and i'm building a new fund of 400 million dollar around that to ask money to distribute so that down the line when all these guys are under pressure to deliver their net zero because there is going to be a higher and higher scrutiny of these commitments the trading in carbon units will become very expensive and we will therefore deliver 20% return to our lps now as rajan said this is not classical venture capital fund because we do not know anything of anything will come back uh, but uh, this is our role we have to actually make the impossible as a target and try to build a fund Uh, so raising the money itself is a challenge but raising the money and utilizing it to actually create real trees uh, that will generate real carbon credits that you can trade in the future hoping and assuming the market is perfect and our prediction that people will actually be under scrutiny and therefore price for units will go up voluntary carbon units will go up and that's really the thesis so so it's it's a challenging thesis but uh, my my personal belief is we will be able to raise not just 400 million but probably billions of dollars in this over next 10 to 15 years and this is a 20 year fund so we are not actually talking about a small fund yeah yeah that's that's massive and before i open it out to the audience i'll just uh, ask my last question uh rajan if you were to learn something or pick something from vinith's investment strategy what would that be no i think this i'm very intrigued by this uh, uh the the trillion dollar opportunity or was it the hundreds of trillion dollar opportunity and i think uh, there's a there's a there's a question also that uh, from the audience so i'm waiting to uh, learn about uh, learn about that look i i think uh, look i i think the the, the uh, uh, by the way that that is that is the serious i i'm very keen to learn that but um but i think you know the the thing that we are trying to figure out as a firm is you know how do you develop business models right that can like you know i think we need to frame this right which is you know absolutely feeding every child and making every child uh, healthy and educated has got to be the number one priority right and and then creating a world where that child can grow up to be uh a uh, uh, sort of happy and 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 uh, human being but you know how do you how do you think about innovative business models right uh to to make that happen so i think there's a lot that you know because in many ways right as 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 tech venture capitalists and you know before this at google you know i mean we lived in this world of technology right <laughs> <laughs> now we are now we are thinking about the metaverse you know we want to really go to the metaverse but like but there's there's the real verse you know? <laughs> the real the real world you know which is like 30 minutes out of gurgaon where there's no water people don't have enough to eat right i mean that's not the metaverse so so i think uh, i think just being grounded and like being figuring out like okay how do we uh, how do we come up with innovative business models and you know they use i mean everything everything uses technology now to really try to address you know those 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 core needs right i think we found we get excited when we find a company like absolute because it has this gigantic scale with technology that we understand called precision farming right but how do you how do you kind of bring that level of right. innovation right. in business models to address these large scale you know sort of human problems right right 
Right. And Vineet, if there was one strategy that you would want to pick from Rajan, what would that be? Oh, I've been copying everything from Rajan. You don't know that. <laughs> We've actually had uh, an interaction earlier with our entire group. Uh, but just, just think about it. Uh, Avishkar's origin was in 2001. Uh, I, I actually started. So I was a 29-year-old, uh, a forester who had never actually heard the term. I went to my board and I told them, guys, I've just figured out the problem of the world is not about uh, idea. It is about capital that can take risk. There was a gentleman on my board who said, oh, that's called venture capital. I said, okay, whatever capital it is called, we want money that can take risk. And I want to take that money and talent to rural India. This is how Avishkar started. Uh, and then I actually figured out, man, uh, there is something called venture capital. There is something called Silicon Valley. I had never traveled out of India, so I had no clue all this existed. And Google had just arrived at that point in time. So Google was, I think, 97, 98, 99 is when we actually... So I Googled and learned uh, what is Sequoia. Sequoia is a tree, but then it has actually also created a company, which has actually become very successful. And you give money and you create scale. So I think uh, what I have learned uh, from my learning from Sequoia is how to harness ambition. Uh, I actually, and uh, I think it, they, what they have done very beautifully is they have created role models. Uh, see, just think about it. Go back and try to think about it. What role model did we have as entrepreneurs, middle class? Infosys is the farthest you can go. And most of us were not able to relate to even Infosys at that time, because how many people go to IITs? Very few, right? Uh, what has happened is uh, Sequoia has actually brought in the thinking from Silicon Valley to a country as far away as India, which was criticized for exits, for everything else, stayed on. And remember, Sequoia was also one of those brave ones who invested in a microfinance company called SKS as way back as uh, 2007. So I was watching that investment taking place. I was making an investment in microfinance. I've been, I'm, I'm the first investor in microfinance, uh, but I was doing very small amounts. <laughs> Sequoia put five, then followed with 35, then 50. And I said, hey, this is not really. So I, then I took an analogy and said, if you want to grow a tree in Sahara Desert, in the desert of Sahara, uh, in Sahara, uh, would you go and put in a sapling and put in a bucket of water and go back home and expect a tree 10 years later? The answer is no. And what Sequoia taught me is if you need to actually build a tree from a sapling or from a seed, especially if there is no ecosystem, it's a desert, then you have to keep putting water every now and then so that this tree can, it has the strength. And that's what I learned. So I learned two things. One, ambition. The second is you keep, to keep watering. Uh, it was very natural. I knew it should be done. Just that, how do you do with money? And so Abhishekar's strategy is to actually do investment very early, but keep backing your founders and keep bringing others to back it. And so there's a lot of learning that I've already taken. And I have not <laughs> made any uh, revenues to Sequoia for all the learning I borrowed from you. <laughs> Okay, on that note, I'm opening to the audience questions. There's one from Carly. It's a little long one. Carly says uh, she's from Mama Toto cloth diapers in Kenya, providing modern cloth diapers and laundry service across all income levels in Nairobi with the aim of improving sanitization and saving the planet from disposable diaper waste polluting our streets and landfills. What do you suggest for startups not creating an app or software, but rather using low tech solutions such as USSD coding? A common question from investors is what is your tech innovation? Not every problem needs tech solutions. Tech supports the solution, but solution is not tech. Interesting. Who wants to take that, Rajan? That would be for Vineet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Kelly, I think uh, uh, first you have to just be convinced that uh, there is enough and more money available in the world and that money you have to search. So if a forester like me could find money, uh, with all kind of idiotic thought process that I had, you have articulated very beautifully how you are solving a very serious circular economy question. And there is a significant amount of capital that is available uh, that would really chase you down and uh, provide you capital. Uh, if I had a running fund, I would have actually been in Africa right now. I would have actually been uh, immediately involved. But trust me, what you are doing is very critical and very important. And there would be enough and more capital which will be available. Uh, not necessary from tech investors because you have to also understand 
like you don't want to build a tech to actually solve a diaper problem. Similarly, tech investor cannot invest in uh, solving that problem, even though personally, like Rajan mentioned, he may aspire to do it, but not as a fund manager because all of us have restrictions. So that's my feedback. Yeah, this is a question we all uh, wanted to get an answer for. Can we get some data resources on the 100 trillion opportunity that we need to refer to? Well, I, this is a simple opportunity. There is no data, no resource. Just think about it. If you can feed, uh, you can make the world equal. Just find out a way. And basically, remember that we have been aspiring to do it for I don't know, thousands of years to make the world equal. Or as I mentioned, uh, how do you actually feed a child without making the money available with his parents? Uh, now people will come up with socialism, socialism, capitalism, both have existed, have been around. They are not the solutions. So within the constraints of all kinds of societal structures that exist, do you have a solution that you can find that could actually rotate? There are 3 billion people who are unequal right now among the 7 billion of us. Uh, that's a massive, 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 massive opportunity. Uh, I think what you need to think about is not to seek resource and opportunity from me because that I, if I had one, I would have done it because why would I not be sitting on a $100 trillion business? Uh, but I'm saying those who are talented, those who are brilliant, those who actually think they can solve global problems, here is an opportunity. And remember that, just go and read Sustainable Do uh, Development Goals as a document. The world's leaders have come together to talk about no hunger, no poverty, no inequity in 15 years. We have already lost six years out of those 15, nine years. Play a role in that, you would actually be probably the world's wealthiest person. Not in terms of wealth per se, but in terms of the credit that you will get from the whole world. Right. This one is to the both of you. Uh, would like to hear from both the esteemed speakers regarding the following. Who do you serve slash work for in terms of priority ranking, GP slash fund managers, LP investors, founders, public society? Okay, that question in, is a little... It's a complex question. It's a complex yeah. question. Very simply respond, whether it is me or Rajan. Ultimately, at the, end of it, at the end of it, both of us actually work. Both of us actually work uh, to have a more equitable world and a better society. We have approaches which are different. So creating more jobs, creating uh, meeting aspirations of people, solving big problems, that's what Rajan is doing. And that's what Avishkar is doing. Uh, and so therefore we start from public and society and then we actually work for, uh, work for our GPs we work for because that's our fiduciary responsibility. But at the same time, the larger goal is actually the same thing that applies to both of us. I don't think so. Uh, either of us can actually say that we only work for self. But Rajan? Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. I think, uh, I mean, at the end of the day, I think we're all doing what we're doing because we believe that innovation and entrepreneurship can make a dramatic difference of the world, right? And I think, I, you know, in terms of the four, look, at the end of the day, in the venture capital business, right, you have to find and invest in the best entrepreneurs and make them successful. Otherwise, I mean, as Vineet said, there's no shortage of capital in the world. Um, so that is really what you're what you want to do, right? Your brand as a firm gets built, as a franchise gets built because you have partnered with the absolute best founders uh, in the world, right? I mean, Sequoia is Sequoia today because the first million dollars into Apple went from Sequoia. You know, you're the first investors in Google, in Yahoo, in LinkedIn, in WhatsApp. I mean, like that's what makes, you know, if those, if, if we were, if we weren't fortunate to partner with those founders, uh, very, very early in their journey, um, you know, we couldn't, you know, for Sequoia would not be uh, Sequoia, right? Similarly, in India, whether it's Baiju's or Ritesh at uh, uh, Ola, or, you, you know, at Oyo or, or Dipendra at Zumeto. I mean, that's really what, that's the core. I mean, if you ask us, what do we obsess about? We obsess about founders. You know, how do we make sure we partner with the absolute best founders and then over a long period of time, how do we make them successful? Because if you can do that well, everything else follows. You know, when I was at Google, we used to have this thing, focus on the user and all else follows. So, so in the venture capital business, at least in the kind of way we invest, it's focus on the founder and all else follows. Um, you have two people congratulating you about uh, one is the 2X flagship fund and uh, gender is very crucial. So it's wonderful to hear from Vineet and Rajan up the game on this and not look at it as a checklist. Apart from that, the last two questions that are there, 
uh, one that says technology, climate, gender, carbon, finding entrepreneurs. There are so many areas to focus. How do you how do you see all of this coming together that can finally lead to sustainable growth and positive impact? I think uh, from a very simplistic, Rajan just answered that question, focus on people with ideas. And uh, we are basically a source of capital at the end of it. I mean, let's look at very simplistically. We are a source of capital. That's the most uh, visible thing that we offer, uh, whether it is Sequoia or Avishkar. And then we have a huge ecosystem that we offer, which is the invisible part of it. And uh, ideas is not what we offer. So neither Rajan nor I offer ideas. But what we offer is something visible and something invisible to people with best ideas. And I think uh, the way you solve the problem is not to focus on this or that or this. You actually focus on the idea of the founder and you allow them to thrive and their success then will actually solve global problems. That's how I see it. Rajan? Yeah, yeah I, I agree. Right. Uh, there's Prabhat Saxena. He's asking, I'm a founder of Shrijan Ek Soch NGO. We're working with rural communities which, with education and health support in Uttar Pradesh. What makes investors or corporates comfortable to work with not well-known nonprofits? I think, uh, I'm, uh, if you don't mind, I'll just quickly respond. I don't think so. Investors uh, or, uh, or corporates are... Uh, working with not-for-profits, they actually work with your idea that would bring about a change. Uh, and it does not matter whether you are known or well-known. It's your confidence, your capability. Most of the people that we meet as entrepreneurs, we know nothing about most of the time. So, so if you have a great idea, if you're working on something that can be resolvable, you should not really bother about whether we know you or not. Uh, everybody would really support you. Great. Uh, Rajan, do you want to answer that or is it what Vineet said? No, I think, uh, you know, Vineet has answered it. I mean, you know, you should keep in mind that, you know, all the big names we know, whether they're companies, whether they're investment firms, whether they're political parties, nobody knew them at the beginning, <laughs> you know, nobody knows. Yeah. So I think, uh, I think, I think you've got to over a period of time, build the brand and get to be known. But, you know, initially, look, people are going to back you. I mean, as Vineet was saying, right? At the end of the day, you're going to back an entrepreneur. You're going to back the founder of an NGO because they have this incredible vision and they have this missionary zeal that you just can't not partner with. I mean, that's what it is. Okay. Uh, there's two more questions. And after that, I'm not taking any more questions. Uh, we're short of time. One is, one is I'm Sentil Kumar and work, have worked in an agri agri corporate for 15 years and now built a venture to empower rural youth through building their capabilities and employ poor farming uh, families into agri value chain businesses through small holder farm procurement through market facility so far i've invested 75 lakhs in revenue of seven crore business my aim is to scale up and empower 100 rural youth in thousand families in three years from now how do you see the impact investing? How do you see this for impact investing? I think that's for you. A bit more ambition. Add a bit more ambition. That's it. India that's... has 1.4 billion people. Do more. Uh, I don't think so. Anybody impact or non-impact investor uh, would be satisfied with 100 rural youth. Yeah. Okay. Ambition. I think any investing investor looks at the scale of the problem you're solving, whether it's impact or even a sequoia for that matter. But in the Rajan, this is specifically for you. You are a prolific angel investor. Do you invest in impact entrepreneurs as an angel investor? That's the last question. Yeah, no, I I, I don't angel invest anymore. I, I uh, after I joined Sequoia, right? Because I I lead our early stage seed stage programs at funds, so. I can't really, uh, uh, you, you know, it wouldn't be right for me to angel invest and also invest through, uh, through, 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 through Sequoia. So I, I stopped doing that when I joined Sequoia a little over two years ago. But before that, yeah, I mean, I, uh, uh, I mean, also look, I didn't have a, I didn't have a mandate. <laughs> you know, angel investors invest in capital in whatever they feel like. So uh, I invested in quite a number of companies. In fact, one of my most interesting investments is a company called Gen Robotics. Uh, they, this is a great example of applying robotics to sort of a very large scale uh, problem. So they build these robots. You know, India has 4 million scavengers, right? And most scavengers will not live beyond the age of 30 because it's a very, very, you know, I mean, pretty much, you know, from early young age, you're sort of living in the most polluted environment in the world. So 
Uh, these guys, you know, they're these, you know, 25 year olds from, from Kerala that built this robot. And, and so, and then they train the scavenger so that the scavenger doesn't have to go into the manhole. They can actually stay up. And then the robot goes into the manhole and then uses computer vision to clean the, uh, clean the manhole. It, it's just incredible. It's called Gen Robotics. Yeah. So it's, it's actually one of the most, it's one of the most interesting, uh, you know, obviously as an angel investor, I was fortunate to invest in lots and lots of unicorns. But, but if you ask me like what is one of the most interesting companies um, is Gen Robotics, right? And, and actually going to sort of, you know, the lack of capital. Now, the thing is, they make their revenue from governments, right? As venture capitalists, we don't like companies that make 100% of their revenue from government because you never know whether you get the money or not. So, <laughs> you know, so unfortunately, you know, this company has 10 or 20, I think 20 crores of revenue now, which is crazy, right? Like very high gross margin. They make the robots themselves, but they can't raise a large round of financing because they're dependent on the government for revenue. So, I mean, you have these incredible civic tech. I mean, I put this in the civic tech category, civic tech innovations. It's very difficult to raise capital for them, right? I mean, this, this, this company can easily have thousands of crores of revenue because you can imagine you build these robots for all these civic tech applications and you take them around the world, right? But, you know, somebody has to finance them, right? So, um, so including Sequoia, we're like, oh, gosh, I mean, you have revenue from government. We're not going to go near that. <laughs> so, okay, but this, this does bring out an interesting question. Do you, uh, there are a lot of angel investors that are quite actually the world they are quite open right now of investing in the interesting ideas and interesting uh, companies so i'm sure you can reach out to them and reach out even to the avishkar team in a lot of ways so it just depends on your idea like both Raj, uh, rajan and vineet have i think repeatedly pointed out it depends on the idea and the scale of the problem you're attacking and addressing so on that note, I would like to thank you all for listening to this extremely, extremely interesting conversation. I have come to know not just about planetary, uh, planetary problems, but interplanetary problems and interplanetary goals, and also a hundred trillion dollar opportunity that in fact investing can have. So thank you. Thank you everyone for the questions you've asked. Thank you, Rajan, for your time. And thank you, Vinith, for your time. Thank you for calling me in. Thanks. Hey, thank, thank you, Sindhu. Thanks, Vinith. Thanks, Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. 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 Thank you.